All right, so let's let's go ahead and introduce you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day. I have no idea what day it is. Wednesday. There we are. Um, of IK. Um, yeah, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Marika van Hook, um, assistant professor, cognitive modeling group at the University of Groningen. Um, I've known Marika. I've, I, I was looking back on my email. I think it's like ten years. <laughs> Uh, something, I don't know, um, and sort of in the domains of computational modeling, um, ACTAR, so no, cognitive modeling, ACTAR, uh, mathematical psychology, and that, that sort of domain. Um, and I've been just really liking this, the work that she's doing in this space of mind wandering, decision making, and meditation, and things in that area, um, but in particular, both the fact that it's paying attention to both the psychological and the neuroscience sorts of levels. Um, I really like seeing how that's all connected together there. So please, uh, Marika. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be back in the virtual IK. I was fortunate enough to to attend uh, IK, the last one before we went virtual. Uh, so, um, but it's wonderful to still be together here. And um, also thank you, Terry, for uh, pronouncing my name uh, and Groningen correctly, which is pretty impressive. Um, doesn't happen very often for non-Dutch speakers. So uh, very good. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to share with you some um, amalgamate of um, uh, research as well as, I guess, personal experience on the topic of exploring your own mind, because the original topic of the IK um, that went virtual for the first time last year was curiosity. And I think for me, exploring my own mind is very much linked to curiosity and it's a curiosity that can that you can satisfy literally every moment um, so there is never a dull moment we always have this amazing movie projector happening um, in our own minds right now so yeah let's talk a little bit about that both how we can explore our own mind in, as Francisco Varela, um, a very interesting scientist and philosopher would say, in our portable laboratory, as well as how we bring that into the um, objective laboratory out there. So, and what I've been working on in my lab in the last couple of years. So let's get going. Um, to get us started, I want to bring you to a poll. So um, I think Christina is going to put this link also in the chat in the virtual IK room. Um, I would like to, um, to invite you to take a few moments to check in with your mind and then just report on how your mind is right now um and and you know what do you think is there to say about this um so it's not like there is a right answer or a wrong answer i'm just kind of curious what you notice and maybe uh, we'll get back to this at the end of the talk um, observing our own minds um, and i'm kind of curious whether that's i understanding or differentiation of what happens in your mind will change over the course of this hour. And I will then project eventually what's on the screen, but you know, you can take your time. So take a moment to just, as it were, look not outward on the screen, but look inward in your mind and just notice for a few moments what's going on there. And so you first can just notice it. And then in a few moments, we'll come up with some words to describe it. So no need to rush at this moment. And you know, whatever is happening in your mind is totally fine. There is no right answer, there is no wrong answer.
and then you can now write down your answer. We're gonna close off the poll soon. I can already see lots of things coming in, so great. Okay, so there's lots of stuff happening in your minds. Um, it's really cool to see, so let's have a look. So uh, I would say it seems like there's a lot of people that are calm. There's also a lot of people that are tired, which is a pretty characteristic IK experience. So <laughs> there's also a lot of people that are curious, which is great. Yep, some are stressed, which is also pretty relatable, confused. Very nice. Yeah, so isn't it interesting how, you know, we're all sitting in this one room and there's so many different things happening in everybody's mind. And, you know, even if we were physically present, you wouldn't notice anything. They would just look like they're just quietly sitting there. And yet there is so much going on in people's minds. And, you know, you have people that are, it's crowded and uh, whirling. On the other hand, there's people that are like, yeah, I'm very calm, peaceful. Um, also others are excited, intrigued. And I think that's one of the most interesting things of our mind is that, you know, it's, um, it can do so many things. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes we'll, um, when we get familiar with our minds, when we start to get used to it, we become more attuned to what could be um, going on in our minds. Um, and we could discover lots of new things about how it changes according to circumstances. And even observing our minds can sometimes really change the way it functions. So this is something that I'm exploring in the course, the full course that I'm teaching in the second part of IK, um, because in meditation techniques, that's really a lot about um, how, when you observe your mind, how that actually can change the thought processes. But um, I'm just going to give you a taste of that uh, today. Okay, so let's then move on to the um, presentation. Um, so now we'll, you know, shift away from the attention to our mind back to the attention to external phenomena on the screen, the stimuli on the screen. And, um, and I just want to draw your attention to this idea that, you know, many of you I know are you know, working in cognitive science or neuroscience. And then, you, you know, you might do something to your participants like this. You might sit them behind a computer and have them do a very, very boring kind of task. Now, um, what happens then is that they are actually not doing the task all the time. So we're going to reuse the same address. I'm just going to switch. Um, now we are ready. Um, so I, I have another poll question, which is about, um, you know, how much, what percentage of the time do you think these participants in your experiment are actually thinking about something other than your experiment are in fact mind wandering well i mean could be the people in your experiment but it could also be when you're sitting in a classroom or when you're sitting listening to a talk at ik you know what percentage of the time do you think that people in general um get distracted so um i'm very curious what you think and uh we'll soon see um what everybody thinks um uh, after a while, I see the responses coming in. Great. Yeah, so I'm just going to wait for a little bit until the responses are no longer changing, because I don't really know how many people in total are going to be responding. <laughs> so but this is always a real fun thing to, um, to guess, to see whether people think, you know, we're mind wandering only 10% of the time or 30% of the time or 50% of the time or 70% of the time. 
And uh, the cool thing is by now we've done quite a few experiments on this and I'll obviously um, share these kind of experiments later in the talk. Um, so we have some decent idea of how often people are mind wandering. Okay, so I'll start sharing the, the results of this. Here we go. So these are the results of all of you um, guessing how often we are mind wandering. So I'd say the majority thinks that we're mind wandering 70% of the time. Wow. Um, although actually the division you could say is pretty, pretty close, um, but uh, a lot of you think that we're mind wandering a lot. Um, some, some of you think that um, we're mind wandering half of the time and actually nobody thinks that we're very, very, um, very, very concentrated and only mind wander 10% of the time. Um, or maybe some of you are, are quite familiar with this research because um, indeed it's actually found in research that roughly 50% of the time we tend to be mind wandering. So while you might think your participant in your experiment is doing the task, actually 50% of the time they're not, they're doing something else. Uh, or you might think of, uh, you know, I'm paying attention in my lecture um, or I'm, uh, the other people are paying attention when I'm giving my lecture or giving my talk. And uh, actually, well, maybe just about half of the time. So just um, this is why I think it's so important to actually study mind wandering because we spend a decent amount of time doing it. And I hope you get away um, um, at the end of this talk with the idea that that's not necessarily a problem, but it's probably helpful to know what we're doing when we're mind wandering and when it's helpful and when it's not. Okay, so let's actually get to some data. So as I said, whether we like it or not, mind wandering is happening and you guys were pretty good at that, at guessing how often it's uh, uh, occurring. So roughly 50% of the time. And the way we know this is we can measure it with um, some um, a technique that's called thought probes. So thought probes are basically questions that we put on the screen and that we sort of enter um, uh, that we include in the experiment. Basically, um, the, um, the idea is that, you know, you ask people um, at a certain point, like, what were you thinking about right now? Was I doing the task? Was I doing external stimuli? But you could also ask them what they were thinking about. So whether they're thinking about the past, present or future, whether they are thinking about themselves or others. Um, whether it was difficult to disengage from or easy to disengage from. So there is actually a question um, I uh, saw from the um, from all of you. Great. And uh, by the way, feel free to pop any questions into the chat. I think that makes it more fun to talk. Um, so the question is, is mind wandering and simple on off phenomenon? And uh, they suggest that, well, maybe, you know, it's there mind wandering that you can have gradations you can be thinking maybe along the lines of what you're listening to or you can be completely distracted daydreaming about your vacation or about what you're gonna have for uh, lunch or dinner later depending on your time zone um so yeah what is mind wandering i think that's a very profound question uh, which um, mind wandering researchers are debating about a lot um whether I mean, it's a categorical phenomenon and also uh, or whether maybe instead you could be on the task 30% uh, with 30% of your attention and 70% of your attention you're elsewhere. And maybe other moments you're on the task for 90% of your attention and 10% elsewhere. So that is possible and we don't really know it from the kind of questions that I mentioned or uh, whether what we really use as a definition of mind wandering, you know, is it um, 
uh, is thinking about the task, um, uh, is that mind wandering or is it really doing the task, but, um, you know, task related thinking? Um, and what is a task anyway? I mean, that's a fun question to ask a psychologist. And it actually in a psychology experiment, it's a very clear what a task is. But um, outside, in real life, what the task is, is, is often actually not that clear. I mean, when you're walking through the park, what is your task? Um, is it, would you say your mind wandering when you're walking through the park and you're not thinking about your walking? I mean... I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think that we have to be 100% like focused on our walking. I don't think that's even that adaptive most of the time. Um, so, yeah. And then there is another interesting question. Are these um, statistics for mind wandering of how often we're mind wandering? Is that different for, for example, people with ADHD? Um, I would say, I think that's the case. I, I haven't really studied um, ADHD, so I'm, I'm not clear on the, on the figures. Um, people do study um, ADHD, and I'm pretty sure that they found that there's more mind wandering in ADHD, but I don't know the exact figures. Um, and uh, similarly, you can imagine that there's other groups, like you can imagine people with autism that might have actually less mind wandering. Um, but yeah, there's, it's actually a pretty new field, um, mind wandering research, because, well, maybe this is actually helpful to mention at this point in the talk. Um, it's got started only maybe 15 years ago, I'd say. Um, when people realize that, you know, you can actually ask about mind wandering in a fairly controlled way by um, including these questions. And that circumvents the problem that you have if you, I mean, up to that time, people might have asked, um, uh, queried subjective experience by asking people after the experiment sort of what was going on in your mind. But then if you ask people to um, report about an hour of doing a task or even five minutes of doing a task, I mean, memory biases are just going to be terrible. So it's not very reliable. But if you ask them, what are you thinking right now? And then if you relate that to um, behavior, then it's much more reliable. And in fact, um, you tend to see um, uh, relationships with behavior um, quite clearly. So actually, um, that let's go um, uh, into that right now uh, for a moment. Let me first let you experience what it feels like to do such a task and then get this question. So we're going to do probably the most frequently used task um, in mind wandering research, which is called the sustained attention to response task. And basically what you have to do is you get a bunch of stimuli and uh, you have to press a button whenever you see an O. So you can sort of tap your finger if you want to on, a, uh, on your notepad or something like that um, to simulate pressing a button. And then when it, there's a cue, uh, which happens only 10% of the time, you're supposed to not press a button. So it's an extremely simple go, no go task. And um, then at some point, there's going to be a question, which is what were you thinking about just now? So that's how the thought probes work. So let's have a look. So here we go. Um, stimuli come on the screen. Oh, so press a button, press a button, press a button. Normally you wouldn't get these instructions, but just to make sure that you understand. And now cute, that, so not press a button. There's more O's um, and they come at a rate of roughly every two seconds. So there's plenty of time to get distracted. And then, hey, there we have this question. What were you thinking about? Was it the task, my performance on the task, distracted by the environment, like the researcher talking, <laughs> um, daydreaming, or maybe you were blanking. You did not think about anything in specific. So this is what it feels like for the participant to do this kind of a task. And of course, you can introduce these questions in whatever task um, you ask people to do. We've also done it in the context of a complex working memory task. Turns out people also mind wander 50% of the time when they're doing a complex working memory task. So it's not even necessary to do a very boring and simple task. 
Okay, and then what consequences does this have? Well, um, the one reason why we trust the responses on these so-called thought probes um, reasonably well, I wouldn't say they're perfect by any means, but um, we they do bear some uh, um, relationship to reality because we do clearly find in most experiments that when people are mind wandering, um, they tend to um, do worse in terms of accuracy. Um, so this was actually, this is a graph from uh, one of my uh, group's papers um, in a sustained attention to response task, so the kind of the task that you just saw, as well as in a visual search task, a different task. You can see in both cases, mind wandering minus on task. Um, mind wandering has a decline in accuracy. It's not huge, but it's clearly there. And similarly, um, you can see a difference in response time. Now, actually, interestingly enough, here in this the sustained attention to response does when people are mind wandering, they tend to respond faster. They just go on autopilot, whereas in a visual search task, then they actually respond slower because they just forget to respond. So it's not always the same effect on response time, but there are clear differences. And you also see clear effects in, uh, for example, electrophysiology, pupil size and um, fMRI. Uh, so neuro neural and physiological measures. Um, so we are going to look at that. Hmm. Yeah. And let me double check the questions. Um, right. Yeah, there's an interesting question about relationship between mind wandering and inner speech. There are some people that are working on that. I'm again, not an expert, so I don't think I would like to um, say more about it, but Clearly some part of mind wandering could be inner speech. I would suspect there are huge individual differences because I think some people tend to think or wonder in a much more um, visual way. Others are much more um, um, auditory or verbal. And so I would strongly suspect that there are gonna be huge differences. Um, there is been some research, especially on uh, relationship between inner speech and depressive rumination, where inner speech apparently could be used to um, interfere with depressive rumination. So that's pretty interesting. But again, I don't know enough to say more um, sensible things about this. Um, but anyway, just to show you, uh, my main point here was, well, these thought probes are measuring something, even though the people we're measuring here are mostly university students and are not experts on observing their own mental experience. In fact, you know, um, we rarely do this. I mean, that's why I actually wanted to, you to do this at the beginning of my talk, because I think normally we just think and we don't actually observe our thinking. And so it, it's really interesting to, to shift this perspective and to realize that you can actually step out of your thinking process. So anyway, um, mind wandering um, here sort of tends to decrease performance on these um, uh, boring psychological tasks, but it's not always bad. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, there's research by, for example, Benjamin Bird, who found that mind wandering led to people um, developing more creative solutions. Um, so here um, there is an improvement percentage on the unusual users task where people get uh, an object, for example, um, a pot. Um, and they're asked, like, how many things can you do with a pot? So you can stick... Um, uh, hand cream in it, like in this pot, but you can also maybe use it to uh, mix uh, paint or, um, I don't know, um, do other stuff. You can stand on it, presumably, maybe use it for your workouts. Um, <laughs> and if they were uh, given to do an undemanding task, actually, they came up with many, many more un unusual uses than if they had an interval where they're doing a demanding task or even just a rest um, task or no break at all. So, Having this kind of space to mind wander um, has been linked to creativity in, in this and other experiments. And you can also use it to um, do planning, which we'll talk about um, at the end of this talk as well. So I think now I've um, introduced a lot of information. So I think it's nice to actually take a moment to take that information in and for um, about two minutes or so, 
to actually go back to observing our own mind wandering. So um, in a lot of contemplative techniques um, like meditation and mindfulness, you're um, actually the essence of it is observing your own mind wandering. And the, the key thing here is to observe the mind wandering not um, with a lot of judgments like I shouldn't be mind wandering or, oh, yeah, I should be mind wandering so I can come up with a new solution to my problem or anything. No, actually, the trick is here to just sit quietly, bring your attention to your breath. Um, that's a convenient object because it's in there and not out there. So it naturally brings your mind inward. And then whenever you notice your mind is wandering away from the breath, then just check it out with curiosity, but don't really try to follow up on this. Like if it's following up a new idea or so, just let it go for a moment and return to the breath and you can come up back to this line of thought later. So let's, let's do this. You can also, you know, Sometimes take a good sigh to, to relax. And then just bring your attention gently to your breath. And then just notice what's there in your mind. You don't even have to give it a label, just observe it. Sometimes when you try to observe it, there's nothing going on in your mind anymore. That's also fine. Sometimes when you observe it, your mind is incredibly busy and it doesn't really want to stay on the breath. That's also totally fine. Just relax and have a look. And then we go back to the talk. So there is a, actually a really interesting question by Udo um, about whether these questions, the thought probes, um, tend to focus attention more on cognitive background processes that are happening anyway. Um, well, I would say that when we're doing our this observation of our mind wandering like we did and we actually spend a few minutes just to observe it for sure you you bring your attention to these background processes and maybe for those of you who are familiar you probably go into a more metacognitive mode if we do it in the in the context of the task uh, of psychological tasks there has actually been empirical data that um, showed that performance on the task did not really change as a um, function of including these kind of thought probe questions. So it probably changes um, the way people experience the task a little bit, but not too much. Um, maybe also because there's not that much going on in tasks and either way people are probably trying to please the experimenter by really trying to do the task well so yeah 
but important uh, question. Okay, so, you know, as I said, you can measure mind wandering in behavior, but one other approach would be to see whether we can actually de detect mind wandering without the person's um, involvement, interference. So actually, this is a nice follow up on Udo's question, because I mean, what wouldn't it be nice if we could just detect mind wandering by measuring, for example, somebody's brain, uh, then we wouldn't have to ask them, which is very nice. Um, so yeah, that's some of what we're looking at, uh, we're working on in my lab. Turns out that it's uh, quite complicated, not that easy yet. So um, don't worry, we're not yet going to put electrodes on your on your uh, head uh, while you're in class to check whether you're really paying attention. I mean, you see some of these pictures from, I think, China or so. It looks really scary, but I think it's mostly a placebo effect, these poor kids um, thinking that their mind, their brain is being watched and they can't, they have to pay attention. But yeah, um, I don't believe that that's really that um, usable. And you'll see why in a second. So uh, yeah. What we're doing, for example, uh, this is work from uh, one of my PhD students, Christina uh, Yin, who is about to defend her PhD, yay. Um, uh, what we're doing here is we're giving, uh, again, one of these sustained attention to response tasks. In this case, it's a task where um, people have to press a button whenever they see a lowercase word and um, withhold pressing the button when it's an uppercase word. Um, again, there's one and a half to two seconds in between the words, so there's plenty of time to get distracted. And then what we'll do is we record EEG while people are doing this kind of a task, um, this mind-numbingly boring task for about an hour. And uh, then we ask them every so often, what were you thinking of? And um, if in the, at the moment of this thought probe people say, I was mind wandering, then we label the preceding five or so trials as mind wandering. If they said I was on task, then we label the preceding five trials as on task. Well, we also did the same for um, a visual search task, just to have a bit of variety in tasks. And then we give all of these labeled trials to a machine learning classifier to learn what the EEG looks like when people are mind wandering and what the EEG looks like when um, a person is on task. Um, and then we see how well can a classifier distinguish between being on task and mind wandering. Um, so yeah, basically the logic of classifiers, I think probably many of you are familiar with that. We give them many examples of two classes and the computer then learns the mapping between the EEG activity and the class. In this case, we used support, support vector machines. We found that those were actually reasonably good um, from you know, the, the classifiers that we tried. So we tried also um, um, regularized logistic regression and um, I think we tried also random forest, but support vector machine with a radial basis function seemed to be the most stable and best one to work with. And um, then we uh, test, of course, on new EEG data, how well the um, classifier does. And basically this gives a prediction for single trials as to whether the person is paying attention on that new trial or whether they're distracted. Um, so um, we have the last poll of the day, um, which is, um, and sorry, I one second, I'm going to have to activate the poll. Um, so it's going to, um, oops, uh, there we go. Now it's ready. So what do you think would be the mind wandering classifiers approximate accuracy? So now you can respond to that. And I will see the responses coming in. And I'll give you a couple of moments to, uh, to respond and then I'll show you what you all think. <laughs> oh, looks great. There's quite a good spread in the responses so far. <laughs>
Let's have a look. Okay, there we go. So there are some very pessimistic people who think that uh, your mind wandering classifier is only a chance. So thankfully, I, I wouldn't be uh, here and might probably <laughs> would be much more challenging for my PhD student to, to work on this if, if we were a chance. But um, actually, it, it's a little bit better. Um, there's also not too many people who think the, the classifier can be at 90%, which is um, uh, yeah, true. Although, actually, if you look at a lot of machine learning problems, you see all these classifiers at 90%. You're like, oh, wow, you know, um, I've never seen that in the context of human behavior. I mean, human behavior is really just a very difficult problem. So actually, you were all geniuses because um, uh, the majority actually voted for the correct answer, which is that typically our classifiers tend to be around 60% accurate or so. So um, yeah, it, it's a difficult problem. Um, and and that's, that's why I say that, you know, um, don't believe it if any company says that they can predict your mind wandering, uh, because we've tried really hard in very controlled laboratory settings. So I don't believe that you can do very well in a classroom setting. Anyway, let's get back to, um, to, the, uh, to the data. So these are um, data from our first study on this, um, which is this um, uh, classifier. And here what we're seeing is um, accuracy of the classifier on the y-axis and participant number on the x-axis. So you can see that um, there is really a lot of individual differences. So for some participants, the classifier is more like a chance level. And for some, the classifier is actually almost 80% or so. You can also see there's different colors here and um, it goes a little bit too far at this point to, to go in deeply into all of this. But basically I, I mentioned before that we had two tasks, the sustained attention to response task and the visual search task. Um, so they are orange and green. And then the cool thing we did in this study um, was that we also trained the classifier on SART and then tested it on visual search and also trained it on visual search and then tested on SART to see you know, whether this brain signature of distraction, whether that was something that's very specific to the task you're doing or whether instead it's a more general kind of brain turns off uh, thing or brain turns inwards kind of thing that can be used to predict across um, tasks. And actually, as you can see, the purple and blue um, the across task prediction is not that different overall from the um, orange and green, which is the within task prediction. So overall, actually, our classifier is um, picking up on the fairly generic brain uh, signal for most participants, except for this one, number 18. If we average across all of this, we get roughly 60% accuracy. So you might be wondering what kind of brain signal is it actually using to predict this mind wandering? Well, turns out that this is mostly um, alpha oscillations. So alpha in a channel called A10. Um, so it's this, this green one here in the back, as well as alpha and C21. So that's here, the more frontal one, as well as the um, P3, um, which is this event-related potential that comes in response to a stimulus. It's a fairly late one, so about 300 to 500 milliseconds after the stimulus. So you can see here, this is the accuracy of classifiers that are um, um, taking all of these different features that we tried um, separately. So we tried the early event-related components like um, that are associated with perceptual processing like P1 and N1. Um, and then we did a lot of alpha and theta in different channels, as well as the synchrony in alpha and theta between different channels. So we focused on all of these ones. Um, so yeah, it seems to be that alpha really is the, the way to go. And this is also the most classical EEG signature whatsoever. So when you want to test your EEG system, one of the most, um, um, uh, one of the best things to do is just to ask um, people to close their eyes and then you can see this alpha turning on. Well, the same alpha is what turns on if you have your eyes open, but your mind wandering. 
So then the other cool thing we can do with this is use classifiers to find out a little bit more about um, what are people doing when they're mind wandering. Is that the same thing that occurs just generally people are bored and you get when you give them a really easy task. So what if we train a classifier to distinguish between um, an easy and a difficult task. So that's the blue bars here. So we can train this classifier and it gets about, um, well, also 60 or so percent correct, uh, comparing low versus high task demands. We can also train a classifier to distinguish the beginning of the task when the person is, yes, I'm ready to go, versus the end of the task after an hour of pressing buttons, they're like, oh, can you get me out of here? I'm tired. Um, so vigilance, if we train a classifier on this, you know, so also we can do this. Um, and we get uh, a little less accurate, but still okay. And then finally, we can do this classifier that we also um, that I showed you before and get 60% accurate on mind wandering versus on task. Now, the interesting bit we can do here is we can actually look at if um, in some way being in a situation of low task demands is um, predictive of mind wandering you know, if when at that moment you tend to mind wander more, then when we train a classifier on uh, easy versus difficult task, it should be able to predict whether a person is mind wandering or not. So we tried that. So we tried to uh, have predict that situation. Turns out that the task demands classifier is useless for predicting the self reports of whether a person is mind wandering. Similarly, the vigilance classifier, which is in pink here, is useless for predicting self-reports of mind wandering. And this was true for both the visual search and the SART task, the sustained attention to response task. And on the other hand, you know, when we take the classifier on the self-reports, which are trained on the visual search task, and it predicts pretty well on both the visual search task as well as the SART task. So it even generalizes again across tasks. Um, but it's a unique signature. It's different from being in a low vigilance state than from a high vigilance state. Um, so I think there was a, another question and now my chat window has sort of vanished. So I'm gonna try to figure out where it is. Isn't that interesting how Zoom can sometimes make things disappear. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, maybe you can send me another chat message so I can, maybe it will, I can click on it. Ah, oh, yeah, that's where it is. Okay. Got it. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, so there's an interesting question. Um, do you think that the classifier is picking up on mind wandering or, or maybe on a specific topic of mind wandering? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. We are starting to look at that in a little bit um, more detail um, now by asking by looking at these other questions that we ask people. So we don't just ask them, were you on task or mind wandering, but also were you thinking about the past or present or future? And one particularly interesting um, thing that we ask people about is how difficult was it to disengage from the thoughts? And this is a question that's about a mode of mind wandering, you could say. And that actually turns out to be, um, it looks like so far informally that that's actually quite a good predictor of, of the for the classifier. It's quite a powerful um, driver of neural activity. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about, um, you know, distinct, going much more finely into what's going on in our minds and how that's, what that looks like for the classifier. And there's another question by Sven. Um, do you also ask about the degree of mind wandering? Um, no, um, well, actually, I think in this, ta in this version of the, in this experiment, we actually had them rate their mind wandering on a scale from one to five. So yeah, you could see that that's a more continuous estimate of mind wandering rather than the categorical I'm mind wandering, I'm thinking about to, um, uh, my performance on the task or all of those yeah, more categorical responses. 
So we've been playing around with it. Um, doing these ratings is sometimes a bit more tricky because then you have to worry about, okay, at what point do I consider it mind wandering? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet what's the best way to do this. Um, so, but yeah, we try out all these things. <laughs> okay. Um, and then finally, you might wonder, so can we get better in uh, predicting mind wandering if we use deep learning? Because everybody likes deep learning and deep learning is very powerful. Well, um, as it turns out, um, it's not a solution either. So I'm not going to go into, for the sake of time, into these um, uh, architectures. Um, but basically, we tried out a bunch of different architectures for deep learning. And on the right, I'm um, showing you some of the results. So um, the orange is the validation set. So obviously, that's the accuracy you should take into account. And uh, um, the blue is the training set. And the different rows are different kinds of data on the basis of which we try to predict mind wandering. So the top row is raw EEG. Um, below that is um, oscillatory power, for example, the alpha oscillations, but also delta, theta, gamma, all the other brain waves. Um, synchronization between different channels, as well as single trial ERP. So these P3 signals, for example, would be in here. Now, as it turns out, you can see that overall, um, Training accuracy is pretty good, so the network does learn. Um, validation accuracy is, um, um, it's a bit better than before. So rather than it being about 60, 65%, it's now up to 70%, especially for raw EEG signals. So actually what deep learning seems to allow us to do is um, to use signals that are not actually, um, uh, process. So we don't have to do specific processing. It actually seems to learn best from the raw data. And also, actually, I must emphasize that this, um, these data, these accuracies are from across experiments. So we take data from one group of participants in one experiment, and we predict data from another group of participants in a different experiment. I mean, mind you, it was um, the same EEG recording system, although actually one was um, originally 128 channels, the other one was 32 channels, but they're both biosemi EEG system. Um, um, but then, uh, yeah, the, uh, it was still a different experiment, different group of participants. So it's actually pretty cool that the deep learning allows you to generalize a lot more. That's the advantage of that. And there is a, um, a simple question, what does ISPC stand for? So um, I, I wrote here is synchronization. So um, inter, that's actually a good question. What does ISPC stand for? Um, um, Yeah, no, I'm blanking on it, sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's basically a measure of synchrony, so um, yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, well, we only have 10 minutes left, but let's actually just before I'm going to go into the last little bit of my talk to explore um, when mind wandering is helpful and when it's not to go back to um, explore our own minds and brains, you could say, um, by taking just a minute or so again to just drop inwards and um, have a look, bring your attention to back to your breath. And just check it out with curiosity, but don't follow it.
Okay, and then we'll get back to the talk. And meanwhile, I can see that the answer, uh, the uh, meaning of the abbreviation has been uh, uncovered um, by the, the vast uh, magic of Google. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, Interside phase clustering, great. So yeah, um, the other thing I'm doing is I don't just measure brains. I also um, um, try to model those and computer models um, to really try to develop a theory of what's going on when people are mind wandering. So really, how do we get a computer to mind wander is the provocative question. Um, so basically we can make a model of the task and then we can make a model of the mind wandering or the distraction. And, Roughly on the basis of neuroscientific knowledge as well as introspective knowledge, um, you might have noticed that a lot of the time when we're mind wandering, uh, it's about memories. It's memories of things that happened in the near or distant past or future. So we can just say that when a person is mind wandering, maybe they're retrieving stuff from a uh, long term memory. And then we can have that interfere with the task and compare a human and a computer doing the same task. And um, well, that's what I you know, synthesized into a model. Um, and I'm in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But basically, as um, uh, Terry already alluded to in the introduction, I'm um, uh, using ACT-R models to um, model these things. Basically, ACT-R is a so-called cognitive architecture, like a programming language of cognition that simulates all these different cognitive processes, puts them together, um, allows you to simulate what might be going on um, in somebody's mind when they're doing these things, um, including mind wandering. So it really looks like kind of if then statement. So if um, my uh, in my episodic memory, I'm thinking I should get distracted, my goal is getting distracted, then I'm going to set my goal to getting distracted. And I'm gonna, just going to retrieve an item from my long term memory. And um, that's how the distraction gets started. So this is literally how our mind wandering process gets going. And then we can give that this kind of sustained attention to response task. And basically what I'm going to show you very quickly is um, we can then um, uh, compare the empirical data, um, like accuracy on the task with simulated data in white um, and see how well it does. And you can see here that it does reasonably well. My model is getting a little bit too distracted. So the response times are a bit over um, overestimated. But the most important thing here is that the model is indeed distracted. Um, well, it's on task about 40% um, of the time, which in this particular data set is also what's really going on in real humans. And we can even ask the model like how often it's thinking about the past or present or future. So that's pretty fun. And yeah, the, we can even use this to model rumination. And I can talk about this at, um, in a personal conversation at IK. I'm going to try to hang out um, in, the, in the virtual environment uh, where, where I can over the next week or so. But basically, mm, we can predict that when you're ruminating, um, when we create a depressed model, that um, people do worse on the task. And this is also what we then found in uh, behavioral data in a follow-up experiment. So that's pretty fun. But mind wandering is also useful. It can be um, that when you're doing one of these stupid psychology tasks, um, Actually, it's it's pretty adaptive to start planning the future, right? So how you're going to uh, um, walk through the supermarket to get your stuff for dinner, for example. Um, and um, yeah, so what we tried to do in some work was try to figure out how can we actually um, encourage people to plan in the lab. And the way we did that was by doing a kind of creating a kind of task situation where people were basically they were first doing a task on the left and then they were doing a task on the right but the task on the right was quite complicated uh, it was a, a rapid instructed task learning task and so it could benefit from setting up a sort of um, mental representation of what people were supposed to be doing which is probably the simplest form of planning 
And so we then asked, like, uh, we had them do the task on the left, which was a, a kind of an end back task. And then we checked how often did they move their eyes to the right and at what moments did they do so as a measure of planning. And the short answer is that people did um, actually move their eyes to the other screen and this actually helped them to um, to do this um, other task. Um, so overall, when they were planning, so um, planning is blue here, and um, versus when they were not planning, um, the planning tended to um, reduce the response times, and these are not significant differences in the error rate. So it did not really um, reduce the uh, amount of error as much on the um, on the other task, um, whether it helped or not depended also a little bit on whether the task on the left was complex, so whether it was a one back task or whether it was a very simple task, in which case it would be quite easy to do your planning in between, right? So that might also be familiar from normal um, life. And then, um, yeah, that's sort of that's where I, I think I want to end just to give um, some space at the end of my talk, uh, I think to move on to the next. So I would say um, my main message is that um, a lot remains to be discovered about when, how and why we mind wander. Um, it might actually be pretty adaptive to mind wandering in the boring task that we ask our participants to do. So maybe that's also something to keep in mind when you think about human cognitive science and neuroscience. <laughs> And um, uh, by getting to know our own minds, we may be able to make our own mind wandering more adaptive. So I haven't provided a lot of evidence for that, but if you want to know more, um, check out my um, full course uh, in the second uh, phase of IK. And uh, methods for this are found in the contemplative traditions of the world. And then I'll end by answering the Question, um, did you check the one over a fractal component of EEG as a feature for the classifier? No, we did not. Um, I think they're really interesting. There's actually also some other um, tools that are like long range temporal correlations from um, the lab of uh, Klaus Denkenkehr Hansen, which I want to try because they've been associated with mind wandering. But yeah, we um, uh, didn't get to that yet. So um, that's all uh, for from me, um, I would say. Thanks a lot. Um. Yeah, thank you uh, also from my side and from all the people which are already writing thank you in the chat. Oh. Um, there were many, many, many discussions during your talk and I think we're just going to the uh, Gather Town space and we will discuss more there. Yep, <laughs> sounds good. Very much. Okay, thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs>